Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our Game Changers series. My name is Leslie Nelson Bernier, and I have the privilege of serving as president of the UNC Health Foundation. And for this is our 15th Game Changer series. And in the past, we've covered COVID quite a bit. And today we're going to pivot and switch gears a little bit and talk about addressing behavioral health in children and adolescents, a really important critical topic really across North Carolina and across the country right now. I wanna just remind you all that you are welcome to submit questions in the question and answer feature at the bottom of the screen or chat with each other. Even though we can't see each other's uh, videos and, and, and um, hear each other, please use the chat feature to engage with one another and talk there. And again, use the question and answer function for questions that you might like to ask of our panelists. I'm delighted to kick things off by turning it over to our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Tony Lindsay. Dr. Lindsay is gonna share a couple of remarks with you and then introduce our guest speaker for today. So Dr. Lindsay, over to you. Thanks very much, Leslie. Good morning and thanks to all of you for joining us uh, today. And I'm very excited to participate in this session uh, because Dr. Meltzer Brody is uh, one of my close colleagues and uh, she is at the Assad Namande Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry. She's also the Director of the Center on Women's Mood Disorders, as well as Executive Sponsor of the, of the UNC School of Medicine and UNC Health Wellbeing Initiative. Most of us strive, most of us unsuccessfully, to be an international expert in anything. And she's international expert in two things, really well recognized. One in the area of peripartum disorders. Uh, you see her uh, work cited uh, all over the world in this regard, and, and increasingly also in the area of clinician wellness, where she is a recognized uh, a national and international leader. We are so delighted uh, uh, that she is uh, a colleague. Now, we're really fortunate today to have her talk some about the pandemic and about the impact of uh, mental health care. Her department has been overwhelmed in this time period. Uh, she's called it the tsunami of mental health needs and that has gone along with uh, the pandemic. And uh, certainly this has impacted um, all ages, uh, but especially children and adolescents. And she's gonna talk about some of the details uh, um, of that. Her department has responded in a really heroic uh, way in this, not only ramping up their clinical volumes, um, uh, a lot of it virtually, but also providing telehealth expertise uh, uh, all around the state. And that work is uh, ongoing and she's gonna talk about uh, some of that uh, in detail. So I will not waste any more time, but I would like, uh, with introductions, but I would like to move on to Samantha and just to ask you before you start your talking points, tell us how you're doing and how your faculty's uh, doing uh, with all the pressure you've been under for, gosh, close to two years now. Yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Lindsay. And it's a great honor and pleasure to be here today. We are tired and at the same time, we are deeply committed to working together and with our colleagues across UNC Health to do everything we can to address the great mental health needs that we're facing. And I think as a mother, um, I have two college age kids, there's nothing that resonates more deeply for any of us than for our children. And so one of the things I'm deeply worried about as the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at UNC is the enormous mental health impact we're seeing on our kids. And that is something that will take all of us working together to address. So now I'd like you to tell us more about the pandemic, about how it specifically affected children and adolescents and some of the things the department's doing to respond to those overwhelming needs. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see it? All right, terrific. So I'm going to share my screen and talk about the scope of the mental health crisis that we're facing in the United States. This comes from a recent report, Mental Health in America 2022. And 
We know that the pandemic has markedly worsened mental health in the US for all Americans. This is actually a global problem. We're seeing national and international data that echoes this. We now know that 20% of the population in the United States is suffering from mental illness of some kind. And this has completely overwhelmed the infrastructure for mental health in this country. Now it's worth saying that the infrastructure for mental health was underfunded for the last 100 years. And now that the prevalence has gone up three to four times, it is completely overwhelmed. And we're seeing this play out in many different ways that are really heartbreaking. So we know now that about 25% of adults that have some sort of mental illness concern are not getting the care they need. That's one in four. And in our kids, um, it's worse. And so if the saying is there's no health without mental health, and I think we all agree with this, particularly when we're facing the crisis with our children, the COVID pandemic has been particularly cruel on the mental health of our youth. We know that data from high school and college age students, there's more at least tripled in the last year. In fact, UNC hosted a mental health summit on Monday called by the chancellor of the university to look at the mental health concerns facing the campus um, that was triggered by a multiple student suicides. Um, earlier this academic year. We know that at least a close to 11% of our youth are having a major depressive episode, a severe depressive episode. Another 15, 16% are having a depressive episode that's less severe, but all to say, this is a horrible crisis. We're seeing this play out across, across the country. Children's Hospital in Colorado, this was in May, um, declared a state of emergency. Um, the Washington Post had a piece that included, unfortunately, North Carolina, saying children's mental health is harmed by the pandemic, and it was really hard to find effective treatment. And what we're facing now in North Carolina, increased demand for services across UNC Health that are overwhelming. Um, psychiatry, we have ramped up our volume by 20%. That's hiring more people. Um, but if you look broadly across Across the state, there's few child adolescent psychiatrists or psychologists outside of urban areas. Most of the state does not have a mental health clinician, certainly not a psychiatrist. And there's a national shortage of child adolescent psychiatrists. So we have one of the largest training programs in the country, and one we're very proud of to um, pump out more child adolescent psychiatrists, but we need more of them. There's also a terrible shortage of inpatient psychiatry beds for our kids, particularly in North Carolina. And this leads to a backlog of child adolescents in emergency rooms. So we are facing this across UNC Health. And despite having one of the few child adolescent inpatient units in the country at UNC at the medical center, um, we could fill that probably four times um, in order to address this need. North Carolina has not made the mental health of child, children and adolescents a priority, and we are ranked um, by new national data 42 out of 50 states in the country in terms of investment in this. This is something that has to change. This is a long-term underfunding for decades and decades, and certainly I'm terribly biased, but I think it will take all of us working together, partnerships, public, private, federal, state, local, to move the bar here, but we really have to make it a priority. So this is where we are now, and I will you know, stop there um, for discussion before we talk about what we see as the path forward. So there are many hopeful things um, to talk about, but this is the state that we're in now. Dr. Meltzer, Bernie, just staying with that, that visual that she did, I mean, you don't have to put it back up, but just staying there for a second before we get the rest of the questions kicked off, what state is number one? And are, are there states out there that are doing this well that we would want to try to emulate in North Carolina? Absolutely. So there are states that have made this a priority and have their legislatures have invested significantly in large mental health bills. So actually Colorado, which was in a dire state, they had legislation and passed a massive mental health bill for the state that included massive um, resources for kids and adolescents. Um, there are states that have made this a priority and um, Mass Massachusetts is um, always sort of wins the day. It's a major priority for Massachusetts mental health, but there are other states as well. And unfortunately we have not been one of them. Um, and I think that now that the prevalence of mental health concerns in our kids and adolescents has increased three to four times, this is impacting everyone. And I would dare say, you, you don't know anyone who's not impacted some way, either in your own house or your neighbor's house or a friend's house or a family member's house or a coworker's house. And this is our next generation. So we, it is at our, you know, a really dire consequences if we don't address the mental health needs that our youth are facing now and help them move forward in a positive way. 
Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lindsay to ask you. So just so the audience knows, we had a bunch of questions that were pre-submitted when people registered. So we'll try to make our way through as many of those questions as we can. But if you have other questions, again, please feel free to pop them into, into the chat. Dr. Lindsay, if you want to maybe kick us off with some of the questions that were pre-submitted. Uh, sure, I'll be happy to do that. One of the questions that came in is a really excellent question. And, and it says, how do you see the UNC programs collaborating with current school-based telemedicine programs in the state? Well, that's really critical. And we've made that a top priority. So um, in the work we're doing with philanthropic funders, we have made it a top priority to collaborate with the school-based programs. And so um, I'll talk about um, more in a little bit, but with um, SECU funding um, and other funding, working with community partners, working with groups that are already doing this is critical. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. We wanna be really thoughtful and intentional about being synergistic and how we're able to collaborate and, and extend. So those resources, there's some commitment there, but it's, it's not enough. Um, and they often really struggle with having adequate personnel and clinicians to partner. So one of the questions that's coming in through the chat is recognizing that there's a shortage, obviously, of, of child and adolescent psychiatrists, but is there any studies that are being done on the damage that this does for kids who can't get required help when they are younger and then grow into adults? What are, what's the, what's the, out, the outcome down the line if we don't address this? Well, I think that's what keeps me up at night and keeps my, coll my colleagues up at night, which is this is really traumatic. And for these kids, we're seeing suicide is the second leading cause of death in this age group. It's been going up. Um, and after the first being accidents, um, the trauma, um, long term depression, um, PTSD leading to addiction and other disorders. So if people don't receive treatment, it can lead to chronicity and at adolescents have such vulnerable brains. So we don't want people to have untreated anything. In the same way, if you have an untreated infection, um, you're likely to have many worse consequences. So while some people will you know, recover on their own, for others they won't, and it can lead to really chronic problems, including what we would see as maladaptive coping mechanisms. So if you struggle with overwhelming anxiety or depression and you don't get treatment, people are going to try and take it into their own hands. And oftentimes that leads to addiction related issues where we're seeing just a massive explosion in the opioid epidemic, other substances, um, or other really less adaptive, if not destructive ways of coping, or the, what we see as the deaths of despair. And I think that what we saw on UNC campus recently um, it's nothing unique to UNC. We're seeing this across the country and it's just devastating. So there's a real window right now for us to try and get this right and invest now and make this a top priority. There was another question that I thought was really um, a, a useful one and one that I think many of us have had in our minds, those of us that have children, is uh, what strategies can parents use to counteract some of the adverse effects on teens in during the pandemic? What, yeah. what things are helpful? Uh, it's a great question. And one of the most important things we need to do with our kids is to have open communication and dialogue. So we need to be asking them how they're doing and how they're feeling. We need to ask them if they're struggling with depression, if they're having thoughts that life is not worth living, how they're coping, are they, what ways are they doing it? Families are often really worried. There's sometimes a, um, fallacy that if you ask about suicide that somehow you'll make it happen, which nothing could be further from the truth in a really thoughtful and caring way and just talking openly about this and then making sure they hear that it is okay to get help and that you normalize getting help. So there's still so much bias and stigma about mental health. And in some families, it's difficult to talk about or people feel ashamed because they need help or they feel ashamed that they're struggling. And if there's one thing we can do, it's really helping our, our kids understand this is so common and there is help to be had and we want you to talk about it and we wanna be here to support you through that. So those kinds of open discussions is such an important place to start. Yeah, those are really uh, wise comments. I, I think there was an interesting study that was published um, a number of months ago and they went and asked adolescents, you know, how you doing? Um, 
and tried to figure out, well, and they ask them a lot of other questions other than how you do it. Um, and what it was interesting, the ones that were coping better, uh, number one, first of all, they had a lot of concerns, these adolescents. And surprisingly, they were really concerned about how this pandemic was going to impact their future, particularly around their educational experiences. Am I being disadvantaged in a way was a common theme in that. And, um, and it's pretty insightful. It looked that what they found that there were two things that really made a difference um, in the ones that cope better. And, and, and one was um, physical activity. Mm -hmm. And the other one is sort of a resilience thing in that the people who had, the kids that had taken on new activities that were more like pandemic appropriate, mm -hmm. they'd engaged in something they'd never been involved in before seemed to do better. And it was, it was an interesting uh, study that might help us give a little bit of guidance as we're individually thinking about, I too have two college age kids and, uh, and that whole thing has been a challenge. Um, and uh, I think we all have those questions. Well, and, and the disconnection that kids have felt being ripped away from their peers, sort of doing all Zoom school, not communicating in normal ways. One of the best things we can do is help them foster healthy ways of connecting and, and connecting with others. I mean, our peer, they, the peers are so important to our kids and how we get them to foster healthy connections. But just as you said, Dr. Lindsay, you know, all the, all the things that foster our own mental health feeling you're engaged in meaningful activities and exercise and, you know, connection all make a huge difference. Um, but once a kid starts struggling, then one of the things we really want to do is make sure we, you know, normalize um, as much as possible conversations about how they're doing and, and help get around shame and stigma for them to be able to talk honestly. So sticking with that for a second, one of the questions that came up in the chat is once you've identified there's a problem, are there resources available to find somebody that actually specializes in child and adolescent therapy, psychiatry, et cetera? What are your recommendations there? Well, I think the first thing you want to do is talk to hopefully your primary care doctor, um, which is often a pediatrician. And increasingly, um, our pediatricians, our family medicine docs have really been stepping up to the plate in a big way. The reality is, depending where you live, um, you may not have readily access to someone. Um, but one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been virtual care and telepsychiatry, which it did take a pandemic for the payers to begin paying for virtual care, but nonetheless, in March of 2020, they have, and it continues. And I think in psychiatry and behavioral health, all signs point to it continuing. This means that we at UNC Health can take care of patients um, anywhere in the state, and that is just a game changer. So we are providing care broadly and um, have multiple new partnerships um, that I can talk about in a, in a few minutes um, across the across the state to extend access and reach, and that is just you know so critical. So Dr. Lindsay, if it's okay with you, there's a couple more questions here in the chat that we'll just jump into. I'll just ask this one. So. Um, for either of you. Medications and formal therapy are very important. However, what else can we do as a UNC community beyond that to work on prevention? <laughs> That's a tough one, yeah. Yeah, well, I think from a prevention aspect, I'm a real fan that we need to make mental health, discussions about mental health and wellness, part of normal school curriculum. Um, and just not assume that people know what to do. And so, I mean, we have had societal trauma from the pandemic. I mean, really it has been in, in all ways and for our kids in particular, and that we talk about it. And we also talk about how you stay well and in a, in a very formal way. Wow. There's lots of good programs that have studied this and implementing these widely I think is really, really important. So we have to just tackle, I think head on that this has changed all of us um, and changed the face of things and the way we're going to talk about mental health, talk about what constitutes well-being, and giving our kids skills to move forward will be really part of the conversation. So this might be a good time for us to transition to talking about the wonderful programs that you have stood up, you and your teammates have stood up over the last little while. And then we'll come back to questions and there's still a bunch more out there. So just hold them if you, if uh, we haven't covered them just yet, we'll get back to them. But Dr. Meltzer-Berti, if you want to continue. 
Sure. So this is what I showed you in terms of where we rank. And I'm going to talk now about the path forward. Um, will require ongoing commitment and investment of resources, but we must make the mental health of our children a priority. They are our future. Um, and I think few things we hold more dear. So we are very committed at UNC Health, the Department of Psychiatry to making things better. And I'm enormously grateful for the leadership of UNC Health, which has allowed us to expand our clinical footprint. We've been recruiting child and adolescent psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers. One thing that's important to note, we're able to hire. People want to join UNC Health. They want to join our department. We have a really large and vibrant clinical research department and a large training program. And people want to come and live in Chapel Hill. So they may not want to um, live other places, but we're able to higher, which has been really amazing. Um, we've markedly expanded how we're doing consultation across um, the pediatric hospital, which has been important, and virtual care has been a game changer for us increasing access across the state. So we're now focused on how do we deliver innovative and impactful new programs that can really move the bar. I want to mention a few. This is a start. These are really not a solution, but it's a, a really hopeful beginning. Um, we just announced last month um, and we are just beyond thrilled with this to partner with the um, SECU Foundation to increase behavioral health access to children through telepsychiatry. One of the things that was most important in designing this um, $2 million gift was that we would be partnering with schools and particularly in rural areas and areas for which there is not adequate access. One of the first things this um, project does is identify two initial sites where we're going to invest in partner. And so that's going to be happening next. And this is being led by one of my amazing colleagues, Dr. Nate Soa um, across the state. We will start with two sites. And then hopefully over time, um, the goal is to expand. We can do a lot more when we have more funding, but we have to start somewhere. So this will really help um, in partnering with schools and partnering with communities. One of the things we do have to realize is that we have to get around stigma and engage communities, um, particularly in communities where there's a lot of stigma about mental health to engage kids in getting care. Um, something that we literally just announced on Monday that we're incredibly excited about the Foundation of Hope is an amazing organization in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they just gave um, us a gift, a $1 million gift to the Department of Psychiatry to create a new program. It's going to be called the CHAMP program. That is um, the Child and Adolescent Anxiety and Mood Disorders Program, CHAMP. Um, and this is going to allow us to recruit a um, national superstar. We're working on this, who is an expert in adolescent mood and anxiety disorders to create a clinical research program and build a team. So this um, initial gift allows us to start doing that. And the goal is to raise additional funds that allow us to grow and expand to do novel research and discovery that leads to new interventions that can be deployed. We don't have all the answers yet on how to address this crisis and we need to have innovative and new ways of doing this. So we're rolling this out now and really thrilled to be able to partner um, in this way. So I'll stop sharing there. Um, that's just a few examples of some of the things that we are doing um, at this time. So thanks, Dr. Meltzer Brody. What I would just ask though is, and those are absolutely wonderful programs that have been funded through philanthropy. And I know certainly we could do a lot more with even a, more additional resources, but how do you intersect with our your colleagues really across North Carolina? I just wanna stick with North Carolina for a second. So we're making all this great progress. We've invested in this as a system, but how do you intersect with your colleagues and what we need to do broadly across the state? So one of the things that's been really rewarding um, Leslie is to partner with primary care practices, pediatric practices, family medicine practices across the state to develop integrated and collaborative care arrangements that bring the expertise, and this is often virtually, um, of our mental health professionals to partner with on-site community-based folks. And we are doing that in a number of different sites. We have new programs going to be funded by um, Duke Endowment and um, Johnston County. We have another program um, in Wayne County. And these things allow us to partner with the people, boots on the ground, living in communities, doing primary care. And this is really, really important. Um, one of my goals is also that we would create a um, 
you know, eventually a dual program, um, residency program in family medicine and psychiatry, double boarded program, um, because family medicine doctors often live in more rural areas and that they would then have double dual training in psychiatry and um, family medicine to be able to live in communities and provide this care. But there, those partnerships are vital with schools and with the primary care um, clinicians in the communities to develop relationships and to develop a way of working together that really best meets the needs of the patients we serve. Dr. Lindsay, do you want to pick up with some of the other questions we've that have been submitted? Um, I, I wanted to add that there was a request um, for the reference and I put the reference in the chat. Uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, yeah, I'm going through these. There's a lot of amazing questions, some of them with uh, very complicated uh, answers, and some of them I won't do justice on. I think there's this theme that's coming through, though. How much of this is sort of the typical reaction to stress that you may see in a global pandemic versus people that have underlying mental illnesses. Uh, we have a number of models for um, mood and anxiety disorders that show that it's a really complicated continuum. In a way, it's, um, uh, you think, well, this is not just psychiatric disorders. This is like other disorders in medicine, like infections, like the coronavirus. You know, there are more, some people that are much more vulnerable, whether it's by virtue of their age, or their uh, immune status or whatever. It's the same thing. We all have a certain amount of vulnerability to developing symptoms of mental illness. And when you have this kind of overwhelming stress that we've seen, it's enough to tip some people that have certain genetic loading over into really a serious uh, a mental illness. And that's what some of the data that Samantha showed around prevalence increasing is, uh, I think that's the sort of maybe oversimplistic uh, explanation of why that is. But there's also people who may not have a diagnosable DSM disorder who are still scared, especially these kids. They don't know, well, how am I going to make friends? How am I going to get my work done? Will I be able to go to college in the same way that I thought I could before? Will I be able to get a job? What's the future hold for me? They need help too. Right there, just because they don't have a typical serious mental illness as we think of it. And so there's, you've got these two separate groups um, that um, um, uh, I think both deserve um, uh, attention. Uh, there was another question, Leslie, that came in, I think before, and it's like, how do we meet these needs. And I think there have been some others that are the same theme and Samantha's already mentioned a, a few things. But I wanna embellish one of the points that she made very well earlier, which ha has to do with there are not enough mental health professionals in the world to treat all these patients. We have to leverage the expertise of our non-psychiatric colleagues in medicine, pediatricians, family medicine doctors, internists. And if you look nationally, about 60% of antidepressants, if you just look at antidepression treatment, are given by non-psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. And so it, the, the, the tack that she's taken in the department to really leverage across the state of North Carolina, certainly within our healthcare system and through our uh, integrated health alliance, to provide support to those practices so they can better be leveraged to take care of these kids is the only answer we have. We can't train enough people quickly enough to, to do this work just in uh, the mental health, the typical mental health sphere. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Samantha. No, I think that's exactly it. And there's wonderful models, collaborative care, which we're rolling out at UNC, which actually were developed at the University of Washington in Seattle, which really pairs um, psychiatrists to work with primary care settings and then use social work teams. So you really, as Dr. Lindsay is saying, it needs a team approach. It has to be working with the primary care to determine what is the most severe things that require a psychiatric consultation? What things can then be um, 
collaborative care, collaborative, uh, collaborative discussions with the primary care team, and then what can be handled by often social workers, which is going to be, um, you know, less costly overall and extend, extend the footprint. So it really takes innovative care models and collaborative care being one of them. So it's not just a matter of saying, we're just gonna deploy 3 billion psychiatrists. There aren't that many psychiatrists to deploy or for that matter, doctoral degree at psychologists, but how do we think about innovative models um, and, and delivery systems? And that's really what we're working on that takes a population health approach. North Carolina is the second most populated state in rural areas, the first being Texas. So not the most rural state, but the highest population of people living in rural areas, um, North Carolina is second in the country to Texas. So we have to figure out how we reached our fairly large population of people living in rural areas and do it well and have these partnerships. Um, and again, I think virtual care is just such an extraordinary game changer. So We've talked about the burden of the pandemic on all of us and certainly as parents. A question that's come in, if you have a parent who is experiencing extremely high levels of anxiety, is that a transmittable kind of situation with the kids that are involved in that family? So if, if mom has extreme anxiety, can it be something that then the children, um, that it's transmitted to the kids? Well, with, with everything, whether it's heart disease or breast cancer or mental illness, um, everything is some combination of nature and nurture. So certainly genetic risk for anxiety disorders, for depression, for severe forms of mental illness, um, psychosis, but then also life events, um, the environment you're raised in, whether there's early life trauma, um, all of those things interact. And so for any one individual, you're going to have how the, what we call the gene by environment interaction. Now we're not able to quantify that perfectly, but certainly if you have a family history, often people come by it honestly, right? They may be more anxious. And then the way that anxiety is dealt with in that family and what tools that individual is given um, in, in order to deal with them and, and what treatments are offered that can really make a huge difference in the trajectory. Dr. Lindsay, what else would, would you wanna add to that? No, I think you said that um, very well. So this is a big question. Talking about the impact of social media, especially TikTok <laughs> and our current political climate on children's mental health. So I know you all probably have some thoughts on social media, but we'd love to hear a little bit more about them. Yeah. Well, without a doubt, um, you know, there's, you can find whatever information you want out there to support your worldview. So with that as a disclaimer, um, I think that there's really clear data coming out that social media has to be used in a way that does not negatively impact the mental health of our kids. Now, unfortunately for a lot of them, they're on it 24 seven and it's very damaging. And we know that um, data, recent studies have come out showing Instagram for teen girls in particular is really horrible. Um, the idea that you have to curate um, your life in a certain way to look perfect and the stress of that is overwhelming. And um, I certainly would not have wanted to have been in, you know, an adolescent and have to live my life publicly on social media. Um, I think that it's neither all good or all bad, but what it is so new and for Gen Z, you know, which is our college age kids now and beyond, they don't know anything different. We don't have parameters on how to use it. And it's actually developed to be very addictive. I mean, every time you get a ping, you get a dopamine hit. And so we don't have any guidelines on how to use it or how to set guardrails, um, which leaves every family and the kid, you know, trying to navigate this themselves. And I think we have a long way to go. If you look at the history of um, humankind on this planet, the arrival of social media in the last you know, 10 years, 15 years is brand new. And we're just seeing you know, how it's um, the impact now. And I think where we go forward, there's going to have to be guardrails. Um, and rather than the, the tail wagging the dog, we figure out how to take more control over that. And we're way far away from that now. So that's a huge area of opportunity for research um, and likely advocacy and, and how each family um, and that ends up with regulations eventually on, on how we manage this. Dr. Lindsay, any comments so, you want to add? Yes, I think even 
you know, certainly I'm of a generation that did not have computers until, gosh, I was a faculty member. We really didn't have good access to computers. Uh, I don't want to take that um, the typical stance that some of my generation would about all this. Is, this is no good. Some of these tools may have made this bearable in the pandemic. I mean, it's you can see that there's some advantages to the connectedness that people can have that's in a way that they don't transmit diseases. So this is a potentially good thing. I think Samantha's point about how do, how do we take the good, but try to limit some of the potential negative consequences. Because if you think about it, um, when we, if we had some trouble at school in my generation, we had trouble at school we went home and we got away from it. These kids don't get away from it. It stays with them until they go to sleep, if they can go to sleep, if they're having a lot of conflict at school or being bullied or humiliated in some kind of way. And so I think we have some real responsibility as a society to think about how can we most effectively use these tools and not throw it all away because there's some really good things back. And we haven't figured that part out yet. It's not just like, you know, let's shut it down and pretend like it's not there. That's not going to work. But it is really figuring out how to navigate it in a way that we get to maximize the good and minimize um, the, the part that can be destructive. So another question in the chat is, is there a correlation between kids who are chronically sick that have mental health challenges as opposed to quote unquote normal kids who now have mental health challenges in a situation like the pandemic. So chronically ill kids versus um, kids that are quote unquote again normal. So, so certainly uh, if you're saying chronically ill, I think you're meaning chronically ill with mental illness or chronically ill with, chronically Ill with other health challenges. Oh, okay. Yes. So for kids that have major um, medical illnesses and struggle with that, they are more vulnerable um, to because it oftentimes may be more vulnerable, nothing's absolute at all, um, but they may be more vulnerable to the distress of the pandemic. Um, on the other hand, some kids with major medical issues are remarkably resilient. They've been dealing with these their entire lives. Um, and some, some kids with who have faced huge adversity are remarkably resilient. So I, I think the in my perspective, it's not a one size fits all, but we certainly see kids who have, um, other challenges, other medical illnesses, and then the stress of the pandemic on top of it, it's this additive level of adversity. So there's a term called allostatic load, which is sort of the amount of stress anyone can take. And there's always the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. You know, what's the amount that just is one too many things that makes the whole thing fall apart? Um, it's really sometimes hard to predict for any individual because there's also people who have a significant adversity and they're remarkably resilient. So the whole relationship between how you foster resilience um, and to some extent it is, there's people that just sort of their temperament, if you will, is more or less resilient, but how you foster that and what's the continuum between you know, decreasing stress, fostering resilience and trying to get to a sweet spot. That's another really interesting area of research. And I think as we think about what tools do we give our kids, um, what do we really try and formally start um, teaching, if you will, partly around how we you know, use social media wisely and, and that um, can be, how do we foster resilience? That's great, thank you. So switching gears a little bit more um, to the, you talked about this during your talk, Dr. meltzer Brody, about the lack of inpatient beds, psychiatric inpatient beds for kids, certainly in our state and, and really across the nation. Is there anything that's being done to address that shortage? Anything in progress to address the shortage? Well, I think there's some encouraging conversations that are happening. Um, and I think it will take lots of partnerships, lots of discussions, private um, sector, public sector, and um, our state government to figure out how 
investments will be made to address this need. And I think there's more conversations taking place now than there have been in years. So there's a long road to go, but it's something that we are eager to engage in. And I think leadership of UNC Health is eager to engage in, but it will take um, broad-based support and, and frankly, bipartisan support um, often to get bills passed. So that's what you're seeing happening in other states. You get bipartisan support to um, sponsor bills that address these issues. And I would say my hope is that in the next few years, we would be able to see that happen in the state. This is this should not be a political issue. This is about taking care of our kids and figuring out what we need to do to invest in our children now. And, and that should be something that we could all agree on. Thanks. I, and I knew, uh, I, I appreciate Leslie that you called that question out because it's such a hard question. And and, you know, I, I share Samantha's optimism that there'll be some consensus around this, uh, you know, really taking care of our children. Uh, one of the most heartbreaking things, when I walk to our emergency department, uh, which has been full for the entire pandemic, um, one of the most difficult things is a substantial percent of the people who are being evaluated for psychiatric issues in the emergency department are kids and adolescents. Because there are places, although those beds are short too for adults, there are virtually no places for children to go. And, and so we end up, uh, I mean, the, this organization, UNC Hospitals, uh, has invested substantially to try to build what we did build, actually, thankfully, before the pandemic, some more space so people could, in fact, be housed in a way that wasn't so um, um, crowded. Um, it's still certainly suboptimal and, and just heart-wrenching that people have to be in emergency departments for days. This is all over the state of North Carolina and all over the United States in many areas. And it, it, you can't walk through there without it really is hard. That's all I can say. Yeah. Heartbreaking, really. And we've been working, and, and Leslie, we've worked with you to um, bring on um, additional um, therapists to help work with the kids in the emergency departments. But it's, it is heartbreaking. And it's, it's people at their worst time for families and unable to find a bed. So I really think this is something that we just have to make a top priority and, and blaze forward. Other states have invested in expanding beds for child and adolescents and made that a top priority. And North Carolina needs to do it too. So we're gonna just make a quick call here for final questions, but I'll, I'll ask one of both of you while we're just waiting to see if there's anything else that comes up in the chat. And that is, can you both talk a little bit about UNC Health is made up of a system of hospitals across North Carolina. Can you talk a little bit about what we're doing at, at just pick one of the hospitals um, in the behavioral health space and talk a little bit about what we're doing to support our partners out across North Carolina from the hospital standpoint? Well, I can give an example and then certainly Dr. Lindsay can give examples, but we have partnered with Caldwell Hospital um, um, in Lenore um, and they um, are working with us on a partnership with virtual care and telepsychiatry to support um, their work. And that's been going incredibly well. We are also um, have a partnership right now to expand um, how we deliver care and have partnerships with different entities across the system um, to expand the scope of, of how we deliver care. So actually working with the different entities, they often cannot hire um, psychiatrists or behavioral health providers. And then they're forced to use third-party companies. Um, oftentimes um, those are difficult, but there's a real problem in hiring um, people. And so we are able to hire in Chapel Hill and provide the support broadly. And so we are working with that with our entities right now. And actually, um, we are very, very hopeful that um, some of these um, details are being worked out that we'll be able to announce something um, broad based very soon. Uh, when we talk to each of our entities, though, and we say, would you like this um, to participate in this? There is no doubt that people are wildly enthusiastic. So one thing that's already funded and there's a commitment for is rolling out psychiatric consultations to emergency departments and to medical surge floors, both for kids and adults um, and entities across the system through 
something um, where, where we call it e-consults, but virtual consults. And um, Dr. Lindsay's played an important role in that, and we're really thrilled about it. So this is going to be a, a huge step forward, I think. Um, Tony, what else would you want to add? I there? really hey, don't Ed? have much to add, but I think that uh, the, the one piece that uh, the folks on this call may be interested in is certainly this is an issue with psychiatry. It's very difficult to hire someone into an area where there is zero or maybe one or one and a half <laughs> psychiatrists. Uh, it's hard to go into that community. So we're, we've had enormous trouble uh, nationally recruiting psychiatrists to rural areas because of that. I mean, they're essentially on call 365 days a year in many circumstances. It's virtually impossible. We also have the same problem with other specialties too. And so we are really trying to develop uh, uh, virtual care models to support the people who are on site uh, more effectively um, uh, while we're trying to recruit people into these underserved um, areas. So one final question that we didn't get to that I want to make sure we definitely ask you all before we say goodbye, and, and that is um, around eating disorders and how the pandemic has really um, exacerbated the eating disorders, particularly in young women. You all it, want to maybe talk about that? Yeah, it's been terrible. And so um, my colleagues who are experts in eating disorders that are um, UNC Center of Excellence in Eating Disorders, there's been a huge surge in people reaching out for help. Um, and again, you know, people being locked at home, the stress has led to all kinds of worsening of disordered eating. Um, and this is something that has been widely publicized um, and they are expanding. They've, we've increased the number of people focusing on eating disorders, again, using virtual care. Um, but it is that has been an area that has been um, really devastating to watch. Um, women um, taking care of small kids, um, the impact on maternal mental health, the impact of women taking care of small kids, their stress, anxiety, and depression way up. Um, and then issues with addiction have been um, terrible. I mean, the opioid epidemic, um, out worsening alcoholism, and early on in the pandemic, alcohol sales were up 60% in the country. Um, not a surprise for anyone, people are locked at home um, and, you know, totally stressed out. But, you know, what becomes a bad couple of weeks versus someone who ends up with a real um, issue with addiction or triggers relapse in someone who's been sober? So, heartbreaking issues that our, our folks working in addiction medicine are struggling um, to address. So, so many areas of, of need in, in mental health, you know, broadly um, and eating disorders, as you asked it, and others being, being one of them. Dr. Lindsay. I don't have any, anything to add to, to what Samantha just said. Okay. So one more question. I keep saying one more question, but one more question in the question and answer. So what can we do for our kids at home to support them? You certainly talked about having open communication with your kids, but any other tips or, or thoughts on what we can do to support our kids at home? I, I think what Tony Lindsay said, Dr. Lindsay said, offer, fostering communication and really helping kids engage in things we know keep them mentally well. Mm -hmm. Fresh air exercise, interactions with friends, not being locked in the room on the computer all day long, um, you know, getting involved in things that keep their minds busy, um, you know, outside of, of, you know, where we are. Thankfully, things are looking better now. I mean, that's the great news. And for our kids and adolescents, they can be vaccinated. Um, and that's also a gift to help us all return to normal. Um, and so, you know, understanding what struggles they're having and then getting help for those particular struggles. So if there is an issue right now that has come out of this time, um, we want to make sure they get help. We've seen plenty of kids and adolescents for whom after this amount of time of being isolated, they're having a huge problem moving back into normal social interaction. Lots of anxiety and phobias around that. We need to address that um, and then make sure we're addressing whatever the struggles may be so they can hopefully get back on track. The worst thing we can do is ignore it and hope it will go away. So I just want to close by saying thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Meltzer Brody for being with us today and talking about this really important topic. It's so inspiring to hear what UNC Health is doing. And if you all are inspired by what you've heard today and you want to make a financial commitment to help us continue this work, there'll be some resources that'll come up on the screen here in just a second. 
please feel free to reach out to us. And then as a reminder, there will be a survey at the end of our time together today. So if you'll stick around for a second and just take part in that survey and all of these resources, as well as the recording will be sent out to you afterwards. So again, Dr. Lindsay, Dr. Meltzer-Brody, thank you so much. And thank you all for being with us today. Have a great afternoon, everybody.